This evening marks a very proud moment for uh, our museum and our staff. And despite the fact that we've had an awful lot of things going on here in the last a few months and uh, for a few years, I guess you could say as well, uh, our education programs and our lecture series programs have continued to move along uh, nevertheless. Uh, we've been involved in a number of uh, book projects in, in uh, recent years, uh, but this is the first time that our staff are authors of a work. And I think uh, this is specifically a, a noteworthy uh, moment because uh, this is a, uh, a case of individual initiative uh, of the people that you will hear from. Uh, I know that, uh, and I'm gonna introduce them in a moment, but uh, uh, you all uh, know the, the people who supervise them a little bit better, perhaps Tom Chikansky, who's our director of uh, collections, uh, can't be with us this evening, but uh, our Associate Vice President, Owen Glendenning, and I think Owen's here uh, somewhere. Uh, uh, where is Owen? Right there. And, uh, uh, and uh, done a remarkable job in our in-house produced exhibitions. And the current exhibition that we have now, the uh, Guests of the Third Reich about the POWs in Germany is a prime example. So these wonderful, energetic, uh, creative uh, ideas and, and events and uh, uh, exhibits are coming out of a wonderfully talented uh, group of, of people. Uh, this same team uh, created uh, uh, a year or so ago, a couple of years ago, I guess, the uh, exhibit Loyal Forces, the Animals of World War II. Uh, so uh, there is a, a tradition now of uh, producing books out of uh, exhibits, so we're gonna have to see how long that continues. But uh, the current book is, of course, published by the uh, LSU Press, and so we're particularly uh, proud uh, of that as well. So let me introduce you now to our two authors, uh, Lindsay Barnes, uh, who is our senior archivist and has been with the museum since 2008, and cur currently spearheading a massive digitization effort uh, to digitize all of our oral histories, our photographs, uh, which are in the hundreds of thousands, and our artifacts, which require 3D imaging to put them all in a digital format and then ultimately online. And we're going to be launching the first part of that on June 6 of this year. And then Tony Kaiser, who is uh, the museum's assistant director of collections and exhibits, and uh, she's been also a member of our team since uh, 2008 and helps to guide the curatorial staff through the collections process and the exhibits, exhibits programs that we are also very proud of. So let me now pass the baton over to one of our own who will lead this uh, informative and enjoyable evening, Tony Kaiser. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Lindsay and I are really excited to be able to share with you this book and get it in your hands and get it signed for you. Dr. Mueller kind of really hit it on the head when he said individual initiative. This was certainly a project that when Lindsay and I started here five years ago, we would come across photographs and um, artifacts and stories of animals in war. And these were the things that we would sort of turn to each other and say, did you know this? Like, I, I had no idea about this. This is fascinating. And we really owe a lot to Tom, who let us kind of run with our curiosity and allowed us to put on the special exhibit, Loyal Forces, Animals of World War II, which caught the attention of the right people and uh, Margaret Lovecraft at LSU Press, who helped us quite a bit to write a book proposal that people said yes to and then to um, help us write a book, help guide us down that path. So we owe a lot to her. I'm sorry that she couldn't be here tonight. Um, I also wanna thank Michael Edwards. Wave, Michael. Thank you for all your help. He read the manuscript multiple times <laughs> for us to help us out. And I also wanna say thanks to my husband, Scott, whose mother actually used her great proofreading skills to help us as well. So. There, it was a team effort, and we really appreciated just the entire museum's support to make this project come together. 
So in the book, we talk about dogs, horses, mules, and pigeons, but we also talk about the pets and the mascots and some of the exotic animals that people encountered along the way. And so I want to turn it over now to Lindsay so she can give you a little bit more on mules and pigeons. <laughs> well, mules were actually my favorite topic in this book, so I'm glad to start with them. Um, mules are sometimes looked down on because of their purportedly stubborn and abject nature, but tough as a government mule still rings true and emotes the hardworking qualities of um, this widely used beast. And mules' sturdy nature and sure-footedness were vital on rugged terrain and passable by military vehicles. <clears throat> Mules' intelligence helped them recognize their own limits of strength and endurance, and this quality is sometimes read as stubbornness, but because of this, unlike horses, mules would never work themselves to death. Um, this image from the book is a mule in Italy getting loaded with the 30 caliber machine gun and its ammunition. During World War II, mules worked around the world for both Allied and Axis armies. They served units in Africa and in higher numbers in Italy, but were really a decisive backbone of support and mobilization in the CBI. And this theater was one of the most geographically challenging environments in which soldiers saw combat. It was a place where mules proved themselves because they were often even more versatile than a jeep here. Sometimes during these harsh campaigns, mules were the only source of supply for soldiers. Pack mule units were created in anticipation of the dire need for supplies by troops who could not be reached by any other means of transportation. The mules were best utilized when supplies were carried by vehicle until wheels and tracks could no longer cross the terrain, and then mules took over for the, those distances. This is an image from um, a Mars Task Force member, and this, you can see the single file line of mules moving through the Burmese mountains. All mules were trained to be ridden, to lead, to stand quietly, to swim, and to be immersed in the sounds of battles. Battle inoculation was achieved by working with the mules around motor parks and allowing them to become familiar with the smell of gasoline and then the sound of engines. They were usually brought around to low-flying aircraft or around gunfire so that they wouldn't be spooked in the field. Through this conditioning, the animals learned that the noises and the events around them would not hurt them. The most famous pack mule unit in the CBI, and probably in World War II, was the Mars Task Force, and this was a successful and self-sufficient military unit. It was self-sufficient because of the cargo loads supported by the 612th and the 613th Field Artillery Battalion's pack. And this is because they had attached medical, quartermaster, and veterinary units. The Mars Task Force was the ultimate proof of animal's importance in a mechanized army in cases where mobility in tough terrain was more important than speed. This is an image of Hiram Boone and his mule Chick. And the museum has a really wonderful collections, multiple collections from Mr. Boone and also his oral history. So I kind of did a case study in this section on him. Um, Boone traveled from New Orleans uh, with the 612th. He was a member of the 612th FIB. And their mules traveled 63 days through the Atlantic, Mediterranean, Suez Canal, Red Sea, and reached Calcutta in September of 44. Boone's job with the Mars Task Force was to collect ammunition, food, and other supplies from airdrops. And he had to be at a certain location on a certain date to make sure that the dropped goods didn't get into the hands of the Japanese. Um, then he, it was his job also to load the supplies on the mules. So he would collect artillery and ammunition and rations, um, including large 75 millimeter, millimeter artillery rounds that the mules also carried. This is Boone's personal riding mount. His name is Chick. And if you can see the small box on the saddle pommel. That was his personal camera that he carried everywhere. And that's where most of the images in the book come from, or taken from that camera. Chick tra traveled with him from the beginning of his journey all the way into China. And of the Mars mules, at the end of his, um, or in his oral history, he said, 
They're smart. They're much smarter than horses. They will not overdrink. They will not overeat. They will not overwork. They are superior in footage and rough terrain to a horse, and I think they are smarter than a horse. This is an image of um, mules being tested outside of Kunming. Um, the American army was told to give the mules after their combat operations had ended to the Chinese army. And unfortunately, many of the mules had contracted a disease called Sura, which would eventually be fatal to them. So Boone and the rest of the 612th felt the best, the most humane way to treat the animals was to destroy them before the disease could, so they had to test them outside of China. Um, Chick actually had contacted that disease and had to be destroyed. So much of this book was centered around, or book, much of this chapter centered around Boone's collection and his oral history, and I just wanted to share the last thing that he said in his interview. I did want to praise this mule, and I frankly think that mules and other animals did not receive and have not received the recognition they are entitled to, because they all did pay the supreme price. So if you're more interested in general kind of mules in the war or in Hiram Boone, that is in the mule chapter of the book. And um, next, I'll just talk about pigeons. Homing pigeons are actually one of the world's oldest long-distance communication means and were widely used during World War II. And they are a type of domestic pigeon, but they're, not, they're very unlike the feral pigeons in most cities. During the war, carrier pigeons were used in every combat theater and saw service with ground troops, on submarines, and bombers, and with the intelligence service. This, was, this is a Fifth Army member in Italy with the pigeon that sent the first message in Italy. Pigeons often had to accomplish their missions under difficult conditions such as bad weather, um, night flying, moving home loss, bullet showers, and even attack by enemy birds of prey. Thousands of allied soldiers, airmen, and sailors owe their lives to these small animals and the pigeoneers who trained them to deliver messages when all other methods failed. This is an image of G.I. Joe. He was an American pigeon that won the British Dickin Medal for animals during World War II after he saved the lives of a group of British soldiers. Joe died in 1961 at the age of 18 years old. And you can go to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, where many of the pigeoneers were trained and see him mounted today, if you'd like. <laughs> Um, these pigeons were, pigeons were considered an undetectable method of communication. They were utilized especially when other means of sending messages had failed or weren't feasible, such as times in radio failure or when troops were under radio silence. Pigeons were also an important part of war communications and where stringing wire was impossible. And pigeons were equally important for paratroopers who frequently had little or no radio communication from their drop zones. Pigeons brought news about the drop zone back to the headquarters, swiftly revealing the location of the soldiers. Pigeons were dropped via specially made parachutes or inside containers equipped with parachutes to, or to patrols um, operating behind enemy lines. The containers and parachutes were necessary so that the pigeons wouldn't immediately fly home. Um, the soldiers collected the pigeons and attached messages to them, sending, sending them home. So you, this is an airborne carrier that would have been parachuted down to soldiers that eight pigeons could fit in there. One of the greatest advantages of using pigeons on the front line um, was that the soldier needed no special training when releasing the bird. He could simply write a message, attach it to the bird's leg, and let go. And that bird would fly back to the signal corps and give the message. This is a war correspondent using a pigeon to send a message. Although homing pigeons' talents are very well known, a greater understanding of their abilities is necessary to appreciate um, their successful use by the military. The genius of using carrier pigeons is their inherent ability to always return to their home loft, no matter what's geographic location. The bird must be trained beginning very early in life, and the home loft likewise must be established very early in the bird's life. The loft can then be moved to different locations, and the bird can be taken hundreds of miles away from it. Despite the pigeons and the loft's new locations, it should and will usually always return home. Scientists have many theories on how the bird employs it, but nothing has been totally proven. 
but they do know that training is, a, is a vital to these pigeons' abilities. Um, this is a pigeon ear tra training squeakers, in a, which are birds that have just, can now fly and eat on their own um, in their combat mobile lots. And this is also a combat mobile pigeon loft, so you would attach this to a jeep and move it around the front lines. The, the military built or pre procured these small lofts for incoming pigeons, and the lofts had to be mobile and were therefore often constructed on top of military jeep trailers. The lofts were built to allow the birds to enter, but not leave without the handler's participation. Um, and they, they went back to this loft always because they associate it with food, water, and protection. War pigeons often flew through harm's way to return home no matter the cost. Many pigeons were mortally wounded as they carried life-saving messages around the globe. Um, the end of this chapter tells the story of seven specific pigeons who were shot at or caught in crossfire and often lost eyes and wings and feet and still delivered their messages. This is Lady Aster and Yank, two of the birds that are featured in the in this short stories. So now I'll turn it over to Tony to talk about some horses. All right. Thank you. So after the bombing in Pearl Harbor, the United States military was very concerned about a possible attack from the Japanese on the Pacific coast or from Germans on the Atlantic or in the Gulf of Mexico. And these fears weren't completely unfounded. Japanese ships had been sighted off the coast of the Pacific. They actually were able to land about um, 9,000 of these, um, excuse me, they launched 9,000 of these balloon bombs, some of which did actually land on the western coast of North America. And then uh, German U-boats had been causing shipping problems for many years in the Atlantic and in the Gulf of Mexico. So the military recognized that they needed to have a definite effort to protect America's coastline. And that work fell to the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, Believe it or not, there was actually two instances where German saboteurs were able to land on U.S. soil. Hitler had a program called Operation Pistorius, where he intended to try and land one or two teams every six weeks or so. And the idea was is that he wanted it to be known that Americans would not be completely safe, that they may have a great physical distance from the war in Europe, but that he could still reach out and create panic and fear in uh, American citizens. So part of that plan um, involved sending U-boats to the United States, and two U-boats left France in May of 1942. One of them landed just south of Jacksonville, Florida. Um, they were given crates uh, that include, it included explosive devices that they would use to bomb or blow up rail lines, uh, electrical plants, water, clean water supplies, just to create these nuanced skirmishes, nuisances, to create this fear in American people. They were also given some um, American money so that they could bribe officials or have living expenses as they made their way across the United States. So the first team landed um, outside of Jacksonville, changed their clothes, buried their crates, and caught a Greyhound bus to Jacksonville completely undetected. A second group landed on the coast of New York. Um, one of the men on that U-boat was John, George John Dash. And as they, they rode ashore in heavy fog, and they were actually caught burying their crates by this U.S. Car Coast Guardsman, John Cullen, who was on patrol. So Cullen asked them if they were okay, and they said, oh, yeah, we're just stranded. And he said, well, come back to the Coast Guard station. And they said, no, we don't, we don't want to do that. So he got suspicious. Um, uh, John Dash decided to try and bribe him. Cullen took the money, and as soon as he was enveloped in the fog, he ran back to the Coast Guard station. The uh, saboteurs continued to bury their crates and actually did manage to catch a train to New York City before anybody got back to where the 
uh, incident had happened and un unearthed the crates and sort of figured out what was going on. So this really proved to the military that they needed to step up the Coast Guard patrols. And we point this out in the book as a story um, as to how horses or dogs actually could have helped. So what they realized is that there was a lack in communication and also in the speed at which they responded to the incident. Now, luckily, Dash actually got scared and he turned himself in and was able to actually catch all, eight, all the other seven people. Um, but if he hadn't gotten scared, it's very unlikely that they would have um, all been caught because that team in Florida, no one had even suspected that they had landed. So the um, Coast Guard's need for horses was immediate, and they did not really have the time to train or um, acquire all the horses that they needed, so they turned to the Army. And luckily, since the Army had been moving more towards mechanization with jeeps and tanks, they had an excess of horses, which they gave to the Coast Guard. They were already trained and ready for patrol duty. Um, so the usual patrol was two Coast Guardsmen would be on horseback, and they would patrol about a two-mile stretch of beach on 12-hour shifts. Um, their ability with speed meant that they could make communications faster if something did go wrong. They were usually the first people if there was a beach fire, um, a ship in distress, or a plane wreck, or something like that. They were usually the first to be able to respond. Um, one story, I'll, I'll go back for a second. One story I did want to tell about the Coast Guard oops, was there was a shipwreck off the coast of Kinnikeet Island in North Carolina, and it was a Coast Guard horse-mounted patrol that noticed the first of 11 bodies that would eventually wash on the shore. And from that, they were able to get start search and rescue operations and were able to save two people from a Greek ship called the Louise that had sunk, um, or that was sinking off the coast of Kinnikeet Island. And then here, not far away on the Texas kind of Louisiana line, there was a B-26 bomber that crashed, and the crew survived, but they got lost in the swamps. And it was a horse-mounted patrol of the swamps that actually rescued all of the aviators. And then they actually did use dogs as well. There were about 3,000 dogs that were used by the Coast Guard to guard duty stations um, and other outposts that they had along the coastline. So I'll give you a little bit more detail now about dogs. I think the thing that surprised me the most is that we think of dogs, military and police dogs, as such a basic fabric of our life. We don't question their ability to smell for drugs or explosives or that, I don't know, sausage you're not supposed to be bringing back from your trip to Italy. We don't question that at all, but the military during World War II at the start, the only working dogs that they had were pack and sled dogs. They had no systematic um, guard dog or patrol dog jobs for dogs. So the Europeans had a tradition of this and there was actually a movement um, by dog fanciers and some forward-thinking military men to get a dog program started. And one of the things also like the Coast Guard with the horses was that they didn't really have enough time to acquire or breed all the dogs that they needed. So in 1942 a woman um, founded an organization called Dogs for Defense and you could volunteer your dog for military service. So you would go to your local chapter of Dogs for Defense and give them your dog, and if your dog passed some basic health inspections and met some basic guidelines as far as age and weight and size, they would take your dog to an Army remount facility where it would be trained and given a handler and then sent to guard duty here in the United States or also uh, overseas. Um, these are two artifacts that we have in the collection for somebody who didn't actually donate their dogs but donated money to the Dogs for Defense to help them with their efforts. And I just like that the dogs' names are Boogie and Stinky. <laughs> So training for dogs was pretty intensive. Um, all dogs were trained for guard or sentry duty, but they also had to have basic obedience skills. And this is also where they would sort of test the intelligence level of the dogs and decide what type of dog uh, or what type of work they would be best suited for. 
So one of that picture in the top corner of the Doberman is probably one of my favorite pictures of a dog on sentry duty. So all dogs were trained as sentries, and that's what most dogs did was guard stations here in the United States. But there were about 3,000 dogs that were sent overseas And they would be given sentry duty while they were in camp, but they also usually had other duties as messenger dogs or roving patrol dogs. Messenger dogs are probably something that a lot of us are really familiar with. They were used extensively in World War I uh, by a lot of uh, European countries. And what's great about a messenger dog is that it needs very little equipment. They usually just had a canister around their neck, or in the case of this dog fighting in the Pacific, he just, that's Prince, and he just has a little sort of cloth sack that's tied around his body that the message would be in. These are the only dogs that were, usually the only dogs that were trained with two handlers, and the idea was is that the dog would go with one handler on patrol, and then if there was an, an incident where they needed to get a message back to headquarters, the, uh, that's where the other handler would be and the dog would go and seek out that handler. Um, They actually did a test uh, where they asked a Marine and a dog to both try to deliver a message. It took the dog three and a half minutes through dense jungles to deliver the message, and it took the Marine another 15 minutes. So they were quite effective. They had a low profile, and they were much faster, so they could deliver messages more quickly and were less likely to be the victim of uh, a sniper shooting or something like that than a a person would have been. Probably the one thing that did not go well for the United States in dog training was their M-Dog or their Mine Dog program. And unfortunately, we didn't at this point understand that we could train dogs to smell for explosives. So instead, we trained mine dogs to look for disturbances on the ground, and it just wasn't an effective method for them to be able to find landmines, and they only had about a 20% success rate, which when you're trying to move a large group of people through a mine field just isn't enough. Um, We would learn later, obviously, that they... Uh, we could teach them to smell for explosives and it would become a much more successful program. But in, and unfortunately also because it was one of the first things that they tried, it almost doomed the dog program altogether. But luckily there were some other elements in play that they kept it going. Um, The other picture there that you see is of an attack dog there in the top corner. And uh, attack dogs were usually given to uh, patrol, as a patrol dog, and it was basically a sentry dog, but he was um, known when that he was let off his leash, he could run and attack somebody who was trying to run away. Not as common as the other t- dog, types of dogs that were trained. The um, Doberman Pinscher that you see there, that's probably one of the most successful types of dogs that they trained. He's often known as the roving patrol or the scout dog. And these dogs would work about 25 yards ahead uh, of a column of moving troops And they were most effective in the Pacific, where the Japanese troops were deeply entrenched in the jungles. And they would often kind of lie in wait for um, troops to come through and and ambush them. And what the dogs did was sense the presence of those enemy soldiers before they noticed the troops coming. And they would signal or alert their handler in some way that there was an enemy ahead. And that allowed the U.S. troops to engage the enemy first and usually succeed in overcoming them. Two stories that I want to tell about some dogs in particular. Um, Another Doberman Pinscher, uh, whose name is Andy, and uh, he was with M Company of the 3rd Marine Raider Battalion. Um, And he had a really distinctive alert where he would raise his hackles on the back back of his neck. And he was working um, ahead of his column and with one of his handlers. And it's interesting to note that on Andy's patrols, not a single Marine was killed. And he actually did, Andy himself would also survive the war. But on this one particular patrol, he alerted and he looked both to the left and to the right. And when his handlers got close, they realized that there were actually two Japanese machine gun nests, one on each side of the trail. So they were able to take out both of those uh, Japanese machine gun nests and the whole column of troops was able to move forward because Andy had signaled. So that was um, that was probably one of the best cases where uh, a lot of soldiers, or a lot, excuse me, a lot of Marines were able to witness uh, how effective a dog being on patrol with you could be. Uh, The other story that I want to tell is actually about this dog that is memorialized in this statue here. His name is Kurt. 
he's another Doberman Pinscher that was a marine devil dog, and he, was on, he fought on the island of Guam. And he was not so lucky. He was on a patrol just above the Asan uh, Point beachhead, and he alerted to um, some Japanese soldiers, and his handler was able to fire and take out the couple of soldiers that were at the front of their column, but they were hiding a much larger Japanese force. And that Japanese force did land a mortar round very close that to, Aunt, to Kurt and his handler. His handler uh, died, and then Kurt was severely wounded and um, did not make it through the night, unfortunately. But they made this memorial for him. This is on the island of Guam to memorialize him and the other 25 dogs that passed away in the fight for Guam. Uh, but they had engaged the Japanese early enough that about 250 Marines were able to pass through and take over that larger Japanese force because he had alerted in enough time. The Dogs for Defense would actually recruit about 18,000 dogs in their time in about three years. 10,000 of those dogs were trained by the Army Quartermaster Corps with about 3,000 being sent overseas. And we really owe to these dogs what we have today in our military and police systems and how much we rely on them for the work that they do. It all really started here in World War II. Some other animals that we wanted to talk about in the book that we actually didn't get to talk about in the exhibit were things that um, were really quite odd. And the first really odd thing that we wanted to include was about the bat bomb. Has anybody ever heard of this? The bat bomb? Okay, so believe it or not, there was this thing that Adam's plan, and this kind of kooky guy had this really kooky idea that you could strap tiny little incendiary bombs to bats, let them out via this specially made bomb, over enemy territories, the most specifically he was thinking of Japan. These little bombs would have these time delay fuses on them and then when the bats would roost in the eaves of all of the houses, they would ignite and you basically would get like a firestorm that would be completely undetected and widespread and uh, it almost worked. It actually did work. They tested it at an airfield and um, the bats woke up a little sooner than they thought because they would sort of put them in this uh, semi-torpid kind of slight hibernation phase and then it got kind of warm that day and so the bats woke up a little faster than they thought and they took off and they roosted in this brand new brand newly constructed part of an airfield and the whole thing burned to the ground and what's really sad is that it was oh, so it was all new construction and because it was a top secret program they just had to let it burn all the way down. They didn't want the fire department or the fire marshals or any sort to come in and put it out and figure out what they have done. So it was totally top secret, and they had to let the whole thing burn. Eventually, this program would be scrapped. Um, although, it, although it was successful, um, it just wasn't practical in the end to be able to get enough bats and drop them over Japan. But um, they actually tested it another time where they intended to set buildings on fire. Uh, and it worked then also, but the, um, the guy who wrote the book, um, I'm going to forget the, his name, but um, he talked about how he had studied bats for quite a while, and at first it didn't really occur to him that he would be killing thousands and maybe even hundreds of thousands of bats for this project. It's just what you did, uh, what everyone was sort of doing their part for, um, but luckily we didn't kill that many bats, just a few. <laughs> And then probably the weirdest animal contribution to World War II was that of spiders. Uh, believe it or not, spider silk had been used in optical equipment uh, back in the 1800s. And the reason that spider silk was used is they, it is so fine that it can lie in the same plane of a scientific instrument, so a microscope or a telescope or anything like that. And that way the, you don't have to focus on each line, which was pretty critical for a lot of people. So um, because the United States was in a major production phase for things like bomb sites and artillery field scopes and, bomb and um, other types of optical equipment, they needed lots of spider silk. So they had these silking farms or silking ranches where people would gather spiders, silk them as they called it, and then sometimes they would actually even split the silk into even finer strands. That's what you can see there on the left. Um, and then they would uh, wrap it or put it on spools and send it to the 
uh, to the Army remount, or excuse me, the quartermaster to be distributed for instruments. Interestingly enough, the spider that, whose silk was the most prized was, of course, the Black Widow, because it's just got to be more dangerous than just getting silk out of a spider. So they would actually send soldiers in Fort Knox, they would actually send soldiers out to gather up spiders to be sent to these little silking farms that were all across the United States to get the silk out. So I'll turn it back over to Lindsay and she can talk about some exotic species. Well, our, the final kind of two chapters in our book are on exotics and mascots, and there's not a lot of text for these. They're more image heavy, so I'm just kind of kind of do a slideshow. But basically, um, when American soldiers left, many of them hadn't even really gotten out of their counties or parishes that much. So to go across the world and see different animals, we have quite a few pictures in our collection of them encountering exotic animals. Um, this is a member of the 27th Troop Carrier Squadron riding an elephant in India. And this is actually from a scrapbook which has a bunch more images of soldiers riding elephants and soldiers posing with monkeys. And so that's a really great collection. This is another scene from India with American Red Cross workers in some kind of ceremony with the decorated cow here. These are um, members of the 434th Bombardment Squadron, and we have a great photograph collection of them, about 1,500 photographs that documents um, all of their time in the Middle East. And um, this is them on camels in front of the pyramids in Egypt. These are some American servicemen with a snake that they caught in the Philippines, and they caught multiple snakes and have multiple different types of pictures posing with them. These are members of a CB unit and a shark that they caught on Midway. And again, I've seen at least 20 pictures in our collection of the sharks that people caught during the war. And then um, these are some sailors on Bermuda with a, a monkey. It's one of my favorite pictures in the book. <laughs> And it goes, and it, then it goes in nicely to the next session, which is mascots and pets. Um, and we have a nice little paragraph about mascots and pests, and but pets, not pests. <laughs> animals' importance as companions too must not be overlooked during the war. Although most animals served in a utilitarian capacity, they also provided friendship and comfort to the humans who labored alongside them. In addition, many units, ships, and individuals adopted pets or mascots in their travels. And these animals provided some lighthearted relief and, um, from the drudgery and fear of life, in sea, life at sea or in a combat zone. Um, these are also members of the 434th Bomb Squad. Um, this was their pet, Ishma, and there's a lot of pictures of her and her with the other dogs and other animals in the Middle East. This is an image of Lady aboard the USS New York during their crossing the line ceremony. Um, she's at the bottom there. This is the little guy is the mascot for the USS Bismarck Sea, which unfortunately was an escort, an escort carrier that was sunk by kamikazes off of Iwo Jima. This is a Marine on Iwo Jima um, who said that the cat captured him. Um, it's a pretty famous image. This scared little burrow, his name is Colonel Sabatus, and he was picked up by these artillery or um, an armored regiment. This is photograph is from Italy, but they picked him up in Algeria, and apparently he's nicknamed Colonel Sabatus after a mythical colonel who presumably issues all questionable orders. <laughs> and then the last picture um, is the cover of our book, and this is Snafu, the mascot of um, a ship that was participating in Navy Day ceremonies at the end of the war. 
And our last slide is the dogs that we dedicated this book to, Ellie and Felix, which are Tony and I's <laughs> animals. <laughs> and they couldn't be here tonight. They're really sorry. <laughs> so um, thank you very much, and yeah. we'll take any yeah, questions. Yeah, we're happy to take questions. Please come to the microphone in the center if you have a question. using dolphins in World War II or was that later? That came a little later. Okay. But they, yeah, so it was really more during the Korean War that they started trying to do the dolphins, yeah. Um, I was wondering if any of the dogs that um, were taken to put in, be put into service were taken from shelters or what? Um, what role did she um, Yeah, have? actually there were. Um, Tam, one of the dogs that, uh, I'm pretty sure it was Tam, one of the dogs that was listed on the Guam Memorial mm -hmm. that passed away, uh, I'm pretty sure that she was acquired just as a stray. For, uh, uh, Lieutenant William Putney wrote a great book called Always Faithful, and yeah, he just picked that dog up in town. Okay. So what's one thing interesting about the dogs that I didn't get to mention was that um, a lot of people, everyone was promised that if their dogs survived the war, that it would be returned to them. Oh, okay. and, the, yeah, and they did. They kept, that. they didn't anticipate quite the money and retraining that it would take to do that. But there were some, uh, Putney, who I mentioned, and another a guy named Harold Gores, Major Harold Gores, he made sure that the Army or the military upheld that promise and returned the dogs. Thank you. Yeah. The elephants that were shown in the exotic section, that those were just soldiers that were on holiday, I presume. But were, were any elephants used by American forces, or were those just perhaps allied the US, forces? The U.S. didn't really use elephants as mounts. I, I didn't But think the Chinese so. army did, and that's really? often where they would encounter them and start taking pictures with them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> What can you tell us about the breeds of dogs that were used? Were there a specific breed that was preferred, or was there a breed preferred for a specific function? Um, initially, the Army had, would take any breed, and they had a list of 32 breeds that they liked. Uh, there was a, like a weight and height requirement, so you know there's no Pomeranians or Shih Tzus in there. <laughs> but um, eventually, you know, there were Great Danes and St. Bernards and all kinds of Labradors and things like that. But eventually, they would settle on four breeds that they liked the most, and um, they were the German and Belgian Shepherds, um, the Malamute or uh, for the sled dogs, uh, specifically for the sled dogs. Um, and then I'm going to forget the other one that they liked a lot. But, uh, the, actually, the Doberman, the, uh, the Doberman Pinscher Association of America had an agreement with the Marine Corps, and that's why the Marines were supplied with a lot of Dobermans. But um, despite Dobermans sort of being known for their fighting tenacity, they aren't great under combat conditions. They're actually kind of nervous and kind of scared. So they did not fare as well. Um, as a lot of the other breeds, like the poodle, the standard poodle did really well in combat as well, believe it or not. <laughs> mutts, actually, yeah, they would take mutts if there was um, enough sort of lineage to be able to have dominant traits of one dog, yeah. Mm -hmm. Given the, um, oh, <laughs> given the amount of material that you had, I know there's a, a lot of records. Was there anything that you left out of the book that you wished you, you could be able to include or maybe follow up on in book two? Oh, in book two. You know, I just feel like every time I thought I was done, there was another animal story that I wanted to tell. There was another dog who was really brave. There was another horse who did something great. And I just... I want to do an encyclopedia of the dogs of war and tell all their stories, all 18,000. <laughs> I just wish I could have told more individual stories, I think. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it seems like with all the collections that come in that we process in the archives here, there's a lot of animals, and it, and it comes from all over, from pets to exotics to 
those that, you know, they cared about her, though, that they donated. So there were, there's a lot more we could have put in the book. We just had to keep it <laughs> a little bit small. Okay, well, if anybody wants to have a sign books, we'll be right over there in a few minutes. Thank you.